so hello um, to anonymous body of people online who I hope are out there. Uh, and welcome, very warm welcome to uh, this event today uh, called Portals in Popular Culture. And I'll just start by uh, introducing myself uh, and then the others. Uh, I'm Professor Sally Bushell from Lancaster University. Um, and I'm chairing the, the session today on behalf of the John Soane Museum and a uh, space popular exhibition at that museum, which runs until the 25th of September. So you've still got time to hurry, hurry down there and see it. My expertise is in Romantic and Victorian literature from the 19th century. Um, but I have a particular interest in literary mapping and uh, place and space uh, and the spaces of children's fiction, which is why I, I'm here today. So just some basic information before we before we go forward. Um, today's event is one hour long um, and uh, it's going to run roughly like this. So I'm going to give a, a brief introduction. In fact, I'm doing that right now um, and speak for a little bit. Uh, then I'm going to hand over to Space Popular, who are going to uh, give us a visual presentation for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to turn to Victoria, who is uh, below me on my screen, but I don't know where she is on other people's screen. And she's going to talk about her wonderful um, magic series, Shades of Magic series, and the role of the portal in relation to that. So you can ask questions at any time during any of those presentations. And I would say, you know, don't, don't hang on to your question. If you're burning to, to ask it, then pop it into the Q&A and we can see it. You can't see it, but we can see it. Um, and I will chair those questions as best I can. Um, I may save them to the end, or I might ask them uh, as they go along, but I will do my best to ensure that every question comes up or I'll merge questions if people are asking the same thing. So we will, uh, you know, we really do want to feel your engagement. So don't, don't hold back uh, and do, do use the Q&A uh, slot there for us. So that's pretty much it, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, let's let's get started. So I'm just going to, uh, as I say, speak just for a few minutes, uh, just to give us a bit of context and set things up for us. So the focus of today's event is very much on the portal in literature, film, TV, and wider culture. And for Space Popular, the, the approach is in terms of design and architecture, and the kind of the different forms that the portals take. And I guess what you might say, a kind of lineage of the portal, <clears throat> as we'll see in a minute, I'm sure. So if you haven't visited the John Soane Museum before, you might wonder what, what is it doing in this stuffy uh, sort of 18th century house, uh, as I did before I visited that house. Um, this is an extraordinary space. I mean, I, I warmly recommend anyone to go and visit it. Um, so John Soane was a professor of architecture at the Royal Academy. And his house is just, yeah, a totally unique architectural and spatial marvel, I would say. So Soane lived in one house and then knocked into the next two. So it's kind of three houses in one. And by doing that, he was able to kind of create these amazing kind of a space that goes all the way up this uh, massive London house and all kinds of strange interiors, sort of spaces within spaces. Uh, he used mirrors. Um, very effectively to kind of create a sense as if there's lots of rooms behind the room that you're in. So, um, yes, yeah, so there's all kinds of spatial disorientation and distortion built into that house, which looks so uh, sort of proper on the outside and is so crazy on the inside. Um, so we can see straight away that there was a good reason to locate space popular within this space, which is always kind of seeking to escape itself, I think, in lots of ways. So as a literary scholar, of course, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try and get a bit of my bit of 19th century literary, literary uh, information into the talk today. And so I was thinking, well, what I was quite interested in thinking, what are the origins uh, of the portal or how far back does this go? Now, of course, this would define very much on how we define, how do we determine what we <clears throat> call a portal? So you know, I, I think you could easily say that spiritual models, earlier spiritual models, you know, something like Jacob's Ladder in the Bible, question mark, it's kind of a, it's kind of a portal, but of course it has a very strong uh, sense of the sort of spiritual world. So there are portals in the Bible, I think, if we, if we look for them, which is, which could be quite interesting. 
But assuming that we're kind of thinking in terms of parallel world theory, and especially this idea of kind of being in, in, in the everyday, being in an ordinary space and suddenly <clears throat> opening into something very, very different and fantastic, assuming that, um, then the earliest example I could find was uh, British author George MacDonald's book, which is called Fantasts, A Fairy Romance for Men and Women, 1858. George MacDonald, I read a bit of George MacDonald as a kid, I don't know if anyone else did, The Princess and Curly, some very odd goblin-y books uh, around there. Anyway, but this is quite interesting. I think, Victoria, you'll find it interesting as well. So in this book, the hero travels to an island on which he finds a cottage with an old woman in it. I'm just going to read the, the extract. <clears throat> Thus she stood for a few minutes, then slowly turning at right angles to her former position. She faced another of the four sides of the cottage. I now observed for the first time that here was a door likewise, and that indeed there was one in the center of every side of the cottage. I rose and saying that I wished to look about me, went towards the door by which I had entered. Stay a moment, said my hostess, with some trepidation in her voice. Listen to me. You will not see what you expect when you go out of that door. Only remember this, whenever you wish to come back to me, enter wherever you see this mark. So it's kind of interesting because it's, it's the earliest version you can find, but well, well, straight away it does so many things, you know, in a very compressed space that, that, you know, others are then tapping into. So both Lewis Carroll and C.S. Lewis had read this book. So I think that's quite interesting. And in fact, Carroll knew MacDonald well, and he read Alice in Wonderland to MacDonald before, um, before he published it. So yes, yeah, so maybe it's here in this slightly weird, I must admit, early work that the rabbit hole, the looking glass, and many entrances into Narnia find their origin. So that was just uh, yes, me slipping a bit of the 19th century in um, as, as I felt I should, um, but quite interesting. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to uh, Space Popular. I'll just introduce you guys quickly. So Space Popular is an architecture, design and media studio established in 2013 and directed um, by the two people we have here today, Lara Lesmers and Frederick Helberg. And they're interested in exploring and researching the future of spatial experience by creating spaces, objects and events that kind of blend together uh, the real and the virtual space. So I'm going to hand over to them now and uh, take it away, guys. Thank you so much, Sally. Thanks, Sally. That was wonderful and so exciting to hear about the George MacDonald um, portal. Uh, really, really interesting. And, and that's, well, as you will see in a minute, that's also about the time where we also started finding what we are also thinking are maybe the first portals and we're trying to understand why. <laughs> yes. Um... So thank you all again for, for coming and, and uh, we're really excited to be part of this. So we are going to, our little section of the presentation here, actually show the two films that we have produced for the exhibition that are produced for VR headsets. So that's the way that they are uh, intended to be experienced. So they are spatial films. When you're experienced, you can look around and there's also in the exhibition physical objects that you can touch. Uh, so you won't be able to do that today, but we're going to show you these two films that all in all is about 14, 15 minutes um, in a 2D format. Hope that you enjoy.
The stories we tell are full of portals. We seem to think a lot about what it would be like to be able to collapse space and time and travel across a multiverse of worlds and possibilities. We seem to long for an infrastructure that allows us to move instantly across space and time. Will it ever be possible? Are we already magically traveling vast distances, like you are doing right now? Sometimes the word portal is used to describe a transformative experience, like a flashback triggered by seeing an object from our past. It is also used on the internet to describe master links that open up to sections of information. Perhaps the most common use of the word portal in the 21st century is to describe a threshold or doorway that can bend the rules of physics and transport you across time and space. That is the kind of portal we are talking about here. The ones we encounter in stories told in books and on the screen, or in worlds within games. Some of these portals can take us across time or space, others different worlds entirely. Some portals run on magic, others on technology, and some are dependent on natural phenomena like black holes. Some are simply defined by a line or a crack that opens up in front of you. Some lead us through trees, others through mirrors. Some are doors or furniture. Some are made of energy and light. Others are drawn with chalk. There are vehicles, bridges, and monoliths, and many more. Eight more to be exact. The design of portals can be separated into a limited number of archetypes based on their behavior and form. You can look down on the carpet you are standing on to see the different archetypes. The ultimately defining aspect of portals is what it's like to pass through them. Is it dangerous or harmful? Does it take tremendous effort or resources to open it? And perhaps most importantly, does it require credentials or keys? Sometimes portals are extremely difficult or burdensome to cross, requiring tremendous blind courage to traverse them. Sometimes it is as easy as taking a single step forward without any cost on the senses. Sometimes portals create complete and utter confusion in the ones that use them. And sometimes they are part of the daily routine of the characters in a story. But one thing is true for all. You are either on one side of the portal or the other. A blue police box an old wardrobe, a pink door, a glowing frame. Portals, we read about them in books, see them on the screen, and even traverse them in games. These magical or technological thresholds defy the laws of physics and can instantly send a person across time, space, or even other dimensions. They seem to be everywhere in the stories we tell. As we consume more and more science fiction and fantasy, Portal fiction has emerged from obscurity to the mainstream. Nearly 30% of the 50 top-selling films of all time contain portals. Why is that? What do they say about us and the time we live in? Why do we crave stories where characters cross over into worlds that are unreachable to us readers and viewers? What is so appealing about making impossible leaps into the unknown? Let us enter and figure this out. Between 2020 and 2022, we studied the portal as told in thousands of stories and shown in countless films, television shows, and graphic novels. 
The Portal Galleries currently contains around 900 uniquely different portals found in fiction from the past 150 years and organized according to 18 different archetypes. The study covered information such as when a portal first appeared and when it has reappeared in sequels or reproductions. We also analyzed how each portal works, who can use it, and where it leads. The immersive film will tell of this study and some of its findings, and in no way it is meant to be conclusive, but hopefully it is a start. The table in front of you is a timeline of the study. It will serve as a map as we explore the evolution of the portal throughout the past 150 years. It shows the appearance of portals in fiction throughout time, with further information and according to archetypes. The steps in the table surface that you can feel with your hands represents three distinct shifts in the type of media used for telling stories about portals. The top tier represents the time before television, the second tier represents the time before video, the third tier represents the time before the internet, and the base layer of the table leading up to the very edge nearest to you represents the time before the immersive internet, currently known as the metaverse. A selected number of portals from the study are represented in discs laid on the table lean forward on the table and look closer and you will see that inside each disc there is further information about the specific characteristics of each portal, which medium and when it appeared, as well as how it operates and what it is capable of. The color of the discs indicates if the portal is operating on magic, technology or the laws of nature. Green discs are magic like the entrance to Diagon Alley in Harry Potter. Red discs are technological, like the Guardian of Forever from Star Trek, which allows for time traveling. Portals often feature again and again in stories. We can trace some of these examples here on the table. The wardrobe in the Narnia stories, for instance, has been reproduced countless times in books, films, television series, radio dramas and theater. In some cases, the portal is the very subject of the story, such as the Stargate of the Stargate universe, which has appeared in films and several television adaptations. In our study, we have found that portals can be roughly separated into 18 distinctly unique archetypes, here seen within these stretched textiles. You can find the names of the archetypes on the edge of the table. An example of a common archetype is the portable hole portal, first created in the Looney Tunes cartoon The Whole Idea in 1955, and later seen in the Beatles 1968 film Yellow Submarine in the form of the Sea of Holes, as well as in the 1988 film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. This archetype also includes the incredible Marvel cartoon character from 1985, Spot who is literally covered in portals. Each centimeter in the table's surface, starting from here, and radiating outwards, represents one year. The count starts in 1950, which marks a distinct change in portal storytelling. Portals in popular storytelling were not common until after this period. They appear infrequently from across the world, from the 18th century onwards, most notably in the 1865 story Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. From here until the end of the Second World War, there are a few examples most often found in early science fiction and fantasy. The period of mass industrialization, globalization and mass media explosion after the war in the 1950s is when the portal era really begins, marked by the Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke, which later became the script for the film 2001 Space Odyssey. The Wayback Machine in Peabody's Improbable History in 1960, and the Toll Booth from the 1961 book The Phantom Toll.
Small Booth, written by architect Norton Juster. In the period between the end of World War II and the Cold War, coinciding with the moon landing, portals were often resource-heavy machines and a result of tremendous collaborative efforts and used in a race for dominance. Such is the massive time machine in the 1960s TV series Time Tunnel, where thousands of people work under the desert surface on a secret megastructure with the code name Project TikTok, which would allow the US military to travel in time. Its iconic spiral design has inspired countless portals in future stories. In this period, we also get introduced to the 20 kilometer long Highliner in the Dune books, films, and television series which are used by the Empire and Spacing Guild in the story to transport people and equipment across the known universe. Its fuel is the spice, the most expensive substance in the universe, and it is central to the Empire's dominance and control of its vast intergalactic domain. The Cold War era, with portals in the form of machines and weapons, is replaced by a period where portals are basic but cleverly designed and often serve satirical and comical roles in low-brow science fiction, family movies and body horror. The time-traveling DeLorean in Back to the Future, the phone booth in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, or the people-eating television in Videodrome are all good examples of this postmodern portal period of gags and gold. The period that followed, and largely lasts until today, has focused on class, status, and even ethnic divides. Most notably is perhaps the brick wall portal leading to Platform 9 and 3 quarters in the Harry Potter series. Those who are born into a certain group of people can easily run through the wall into a future of power and privilege, while the rest would, symbolically and literally, smash their face against the brick and never know the life on the other side. There are countless stories during this period and until today where portals are out of reach to most and accessible only to a selected few, in some cases only to one single person. If these are the stories we want to hear, what does this say about us? Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy that. Um, and uh, obviously, this is a summary, sort of these two films of uh, uh, quite a few years of research that we've had the chance to do together with the Sol Museum and curator uh, Erin, who's at the Sol Museum. And with that, we'll hand back to you, Sally. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, fantastic uh, to to see those films. I saw them in the in the museum in the VR headset. It was a very very hot day <laughs> when I went down. It was about thirty five degrees in London. So actually, it was interesting because it was it was almost better. Although you had the materiality in the museum, it was it was actually really good just seeing them as films as well. It worked really well both ways. I think. So just a reminder to people: do feel free to put questions in the the Q and A for us. It's sadly empty at the moment where we're ready and eager to answer your questions um a, a couple of of thoughts then um uh, for for frederick and lara, uh, lara if I was thinking about um in advance i mean one thing that struck me when you're going going through all the different types of um portal was you know you know some of them some of the portals are vertical some of the portals are horizontal for example that's quite a clear there's quite a clear def distinction there and does that, you know, does that make a difference? And actually, of course, that's in Alice because Alice's first portal is um, 
down <laughs> and her second portal is across the chessboard. So she, again, you know, this happens so often in literature, like the first very defining early text, just do everything and there's nothing left to do. Um, so yeah, she sort of goes down and across. So I was just thinking about that and thinking, does it, you know, is there a difference in how you how you enter the portal or any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, we we had to think about quite a lot about how to basically narrow down or define uh, portal. And in this case, we decided for um, physical thresholds, no? like uh, actually an actual threshold that you go through in a way, regardless of uh, direction or even depth. No, some of them have no depth whatsoever. Um, and that was a big thing because uh, when you start talking about portals, a lot of the use of the word portal is tends to be perhaps quite metaphorical, uh, where there might not be anything physical or an idea or uh, a way of thinking can be a portal to something, right? And you realize how much we use uh, the word portal. So the the, the definition is uh, some form of physical threshold that you take your yeah. portal through. Um, and then, I mean, then we have the, the archetypes, which are actually based on uh, morphological categories. So, for example, Alice's portal in the tree would belong to the, the tree category. Mm -hmm. um, but then there is also holes, which that one could also uh, uh, be a part of. No, And the, the ones that you go across and go ahead are very often doors. Mm -hmm. um, that you step through, right, or or maybe also cracks that that mm -hmm. uh, and you walk through. So we the the categories we created are morphological and are perhaps addressing that because we felt that like from a design perspective, um, maybe focusing on the morphology is what well the kind of um, most uh, well the easiest way to group them or the most uh, obvious mm -hmm. intuitive way of sure. uh, of grouping them. Cool. Okay, there's a few questions here, so I'll just uh, let's have a quick. Oh, yeah, look at these. <laughs> um, so um, Jay Mitchell asks, "What about portals that are not written in literature?" I know. Yeah, I mean, so filmic portals weren't there in there? Lots of filmic and TV. Yeah, yeah. We we uh, we're not writers. We're designers, and uh, um, <laughs> and we read as much as we could but i would say that the, the our main source actually is portals that are that have been visually represented so through comics movies tv or video games or yeah. graphic novels uh, i think actually that's for, for our research that's the main main source i would say um which also i think is is what has largely kind of propelled portals in the common sort of the collective imagination let's say because we now see them a lot which obviously in the past um they were rarely drawn you know we, we see alice going through the mirror but uh, in an illustration but they were they were not so common so i think actually um and we've looked at a sort of overview over what mediums have been used when etc and uh, one could imagine that novels or or, or literature would sort of be overtaken by films, but there's obviously an incredible amount, an increasing so of portal fiction in literature, as well as in films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's interesting. I think that what, what you're saying, thirty percent. That, that's very interesting. Why? Why? What's going on there? I don't know. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna pick out a few questions now. We can come back to some of these later um with victoria as well uh, where they're relevant to her as well i think so uh Leo leonora asks this is a good question i think leonora do you see an do you see an edible item as being a portal i'm thinking of the red and blue pills in the matrix i mean edible items also in alice of course but yeah yeah this this is the question right like where do we where do we stop and we were mm. i must mm. say that like always mm. making this archive we were thinking uh of precedents for basically making portals in virtual reality in the immersive internet and hopefully <laughs> we will not have to eat things <laughs> in virtual yeah. reality but maybe we do and it's wonderful um but so of, i would say yes it's a portal i mean i think the, commonly people would say it's a portal mm. however we, we try mm. to confine ourselves to um thresholds that is that mm. yeah so we, we had to make a distinction because generally also it's so much more complex and wide than we could ever imagine. So our study does not include teleportation or what we're calling telepresence. So the matrix, as it relates to here, 
the whole matrix essentially is not for us a portal in this study. We categorize this as, as telepresence. And it's interesting in Victoria's books where there's ways to travel to the worlds, both through what we'd call a portal, but also what we would call yeah. telepresence through essentially transferring your mind to someone else's body in the other world. And obviously all these things are interlinked as we also in Victoria's books, we see so clearly that they, they are one and the same in the sort of ways that you interact between different worlds. Um, but in our case, we had to make a, a distinction. So that's in the study in the film that you mm -hmm. saw, we do not include um, the matrix. Although there are examples from the matrix uh, that are actually portals in the sense done by the, the key maker where where you actually literally open a door into a corridor and then open another door to completely move uh, vast distances throughout the, the matrix. Mm. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, two more questions before we we move on to um, Victoria. Victoria, feel free to chip in as well in the conversation. You don't, you, you feel free. <laughs> no, it's it's all fascinating to me. I found the present. I, I I I would because I'm like a creative. My mind breaks down around the boundaries of what is and what isn't because mm -hmm. I become the contrarian who wants to argue that oh well when they're doing the testing grounds inside the matrix where they're learning skills that I understand that you would call that telepresence, but I still argue because it breaks the rules of space and time and creates a new yeah. isolated like space. Does a contained space that can only be accessed by one person within themselves mm. not qualify as a portal? Does it have to be external to a place where yeah. hypothetically other people could reach communal space? So my brain, as a writer, my brain's gonna go off into 10 directions. So I'm just gonna listen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking that the, the, the pill question is a really good question because it's like, is, is the thresh, does the threshold have to be physical and exterior or is, can a threshold be interior? Yeah. And another question someone was asking is like, how does the threshold act upon you? So in a way, that's those things start to get quite mixed up, don't they, at, at that point? Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so you guys, you poor guys had to had to draw the line somewhere. So you <laughs> stick with the threshold, the physical threshold. So um, David, David Hodgson says, this is a good question. What from literature is the biggest origin of portals or or what they use for in a way saying escape, exploration, adventure or a quest? So I guess in a way you're asking David, you know, what kind of narrative connect it, it brings the portal into being, I guess, in a way. Uh, this is very, very interesting also. And actually, from the point of view that we're coming as designers, we have mainly looked at the portals as design objects, almost like, you know, the, their liminal dimension is what we are, we're using the centropological term to describe just the, the depth of it, essentially. Um, and then from there, like, do you need a key? How long can it be open? Where does it lead, etc.? Just as if it's a vehicle, literally. And now from there, looking at the story, and obviously what is on either side is what defines it as an interesting narrative device. Um, mm, yeah. And I think from what we can see, some broad kind of uh, ideas here is that the early examples, Alice in Wonderland being a great one, often they involve children and often they involve reactions that are quite unrealistic, let's say. They're like, oh, I'm in this strange world now. And, and uh, self, um, self discovery, right? Or like going into these magical worlds where you go through a process mm. yourself. Yes, you yes. Like yeah. a different person, right? Yes. Yeah. And quite often and, they're and, also, and, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sally. Sorry. I was just going to say, uh, just I'm just thinking about what you're saying that they're often counter, counter models. It's, it's like where the world, you know, Alice's world is very repressive, Victorian repression, and this yeah. is, it's, it's, it's an escape. So quite often the portal is allowing a counter model that, you know, that, that, that allows you to be a different person maybe as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, I would argue it, yeah. you kind of have to take motive out of it from a storytelling perspective, because the story is what decides, like, you could label something an adventure or an escape, mm -hmm. uh, but like it, in a good story, it's all of those things. In a good story, yeah. like the the reason that they go through the door is less important than what happens to them beyond the door. Yeah. Like there's yeah. a lot that drives them, but it can be any of the above. A good story, it is an escape, whether or not they realize it. It is an adventure, whether or not they're prepared for it. It is a quest, whether or not they're ready or want yeah. to go on. Like it's all of those things. It's yeah. less manifested by a specific desire and more by a need of the story. Mm. Yeah, which is so wonderful yeah. in Victoria in your in your yeah. books because it's 
it's uh, it's used in so many ways at the same time. It's both an everyday tool for some people, but it's an extreme sense of discovery for other characters at the same time. Exactly. And that gets into a completely different category of like the insider outsider, the person who is an expert at using the portal and for whom it is it is part of their language, part of their lexicon, and the person who ha is thrust through the portal and then has to figure it out on the other side. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that struck me in your um, in the presentation was um, that at some point you said something like you you have it's like well I don't think you did say a leap of faith but you said that there's you know I thought that was really interesting that kind of almost a portal state or or having the courage like like you say to you know I mean uh, there's no way I would want to go into another parallel universe no <laughs> way I, I, I maybe when I was younger I would but you know that's just a living hell to me so you know, again it's got to be a kind of a certain kind of person, a certain kind of being drawn to that, or being brave enough. It's, it's, it is an act of courage to cross to cross that threshold. Yeah, actually, there is an interesting question uh, by Lawrence Loniger for Victoria, oh, yeah. asking if you think that limiting who can traverse a portal was a driving force for the structure of the books. And actually, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll get to that, but I'll, for now, I'll just say, obviously, like, I, I'm so interested in insider outsider culture. And so part of that is designating the person who is expected to be able to cross this threshold. And what happens when somebody who shouldn't be able to who has not been designated um, upends the, the kind of the MO of the system of the world by crossing and that becomes a huge plot point is that Kalmarash is a magician who has the ability to cross this threshold. Lyle Bard is not supposed to have that ability and crosses it, thus throwing things into chaos. And so I'm always really fascinated by this, you know, singular entity. I know it came up in your presentation, the idea of the one that's chosen, the one who has the key or the magic, the ability, the access. Um, and I like subverting that in stories. So what happens when we realize it's not actually the chosen one, that person just happened to know where the key was and somebody else found it. Mm -hmm. And I also just really, there was a piece in your presentation that I don't want to forget about because I love so much, which is, it was a really small note, but the concept to, to your point, Sally, about bravery, about the portals that we cannot see through, the opaque portal, which is like 99% of portals, right? You actually can't see through the door to know what's on the other side of it. And that itself is an entirely different component from say my latest novel, Gallant, which has a door that you can see through, but what you see is not actually what's on the other side. Oh, well, so what happens when you entrap a character into thinking that they know what's on the other side of a door and it's not? Wow. And I mean, this is what's so fascinating for us as well, because of course, this, uh, well, what Lauren was asking, um, this uh, being allowed or not being allowed makes for uh, this very interesting setup for, for stories, right? But well, and usually, <laughs> usually the who's allowed and who's not allowed is often not being decided by the portal. It's just being decided by the people who have access to the portal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in Chains of Magic, it's a little different because it does actually require a specific person to go through not everyone can physically cross but the vast majority of portals it's a question of access not not ability yeah that, i mean that's so fascinating because for us also as designers what we're seeing is that like all of these portals in fiction in books in movies are going to be the precedent to create the immersive internet and then exactly. what worked very well for a as a device for a story is that what we want to recreate? Or like how much of that do we take? Or like how much of an understanding do we have when we maybe take the, the way these things look and the mechanics of these things and smack them into something that we might be using uh, on a day to day, right? But anyhow. <laughs> Especially because the internet as portal, like the the internet is such a an equalizer in terms of access. Like it's something for which most people have a, a level of access that they wouldn't in the physical right. world. So any kind of, doors that you then impose on them become a kind of restriction instead of access like the portals it's the people are imposing doors on something they're closing doors against something that is by default open right exactly i think as well that the, the portal the kind of model of the portal threatens to run out of control so i think your approach in the project is very interesting to me because it's very it the subject is so so abstract and so yeah sort of exciting and so on 
and but you're you're sort of almost trying to kind of control like you have all these lists and all these typologies and yet it's kind of constantly overflowing do you know what i mean yeah. oh yeah yeah we, we are exactly what yeah. you mean it's like it spills <laughs> everywhere and you're like i don't know maybe it's like this but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we 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 had as a, as a rule that when people tell us examples that are already in the archive for a few times then we'll be happy but that never happened people <laughs> yeah, still yeah, yeah. yeah exactly no i know that when I did my last book on literary maps, every time so I say to someone, I'm writing a book on literary maps. Oh, do you know this map? Do you know that? Yes, I know that map. Or, or, or <laughs> no, another, not another one. You know? yeah. Okay, we're going to turn to Victoria in just a second. There's one more question I think I'd just like to write, raise, because I think it's a really interesting question from Niall. Is there a dominant culture that tends to portray portals? If so, any thoughts as to why? A very, very interesting question. And uh, it is not mentioned in, this, in the film here, but obviously... It, we are looking from a very specific perspective, uh, white European perspective, which means that the I mean, archive no, is not. Say, we, we both speak English, Swedish and Spanish. So mm. that's all that we could cover mm. in a sense, right? But so... we, the best of our abilities, it's it does seem like the, the sort of age of portal that we're in now has its roots in, in a lot of literature and books from from the UK or from Europe. But this is really something that we, we we don't pretend to make any claims because there's so much we don't know. And also, of course, we chose to only look at at um, portals that appear in popular culture, largely really from Alice in Wonderland onwards. And we did not include studies from religion <clears throat> or folklore, uh, obviously, which is we have began that study as for a next chapter. <laughs> Um, An emphasis <clears throat> on, yeah, we, we don't speak any other languages. So, for example, I mean... So many people in in our environment didn't even know about Doraemon, <laughs> and that's like so even, Japanese. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I know Doraemon because yeah. I was in China with my son, and he loves Doraemon. But yeah, and that's incredibly popular, right? So if even that is kind yes, of yeah, that's, that's niche. For, imagine all that we're mm -hmm. also missing out. Yeah, so we wouldn't dare say. Yeah. Because so I guess the answer to our question is the portal is almost certainly subject to cultural difference, and there probably are all kinds of portals. Where we, this is pretty much certainly the Western portal, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's really it's a really good point, though. I think it's really interesting, and mm. it might be very different. It might function very differently in another culture. It would be fascinating to if we had the means to collaborate with people who could mm. uh, research that other in other languages would be fascinating, and also as Rick was saying, religion and uh, folklore. So um, uh, I was worried that no one would ask questions. Now we're like the opposite extreme. There are there are hundreds on there, and I'm not going to get through <laughs> this. So I, I, I'm sorry if we don't, but we'll we'll try. Maybe um, Lara and um, Frederick, you could you can just you can type an answer in there. So whilst whilst Victoria's talking, try and catch up for me um, with any that we haven't answered and type some answers in. That would be great. Um, we will try and cover what we can. So turning turning to um, Victoria Schwab, whom we're very pleased to have uh, here today. And as I'm sure you will know, she's an American writer of young adult fiction and graphic novels, uh, best known for her, her Shades of Magic uh, series. Yes, we've diligently read, uh, both Frederick and I have read the first book, <laughs> loved it so much, I bought the next two. I'm on to the second one, so don't give me any plot spoilers no today. Spoilers. That's the no only thing I ask. Um, so I will uh, open to questions uh, in, in a moment. I'll just ask a couple of questions of my own, I guess, Victoria, just could you just summarize yeah. sort of very not not you know loosely the the kind of the plot and that that question that Lauren was asking you know how the how the portals are you know, yeah. relevant to the core of the books just for people who may not have read them. Of uh, course, so of course. Tell yourself. Of course. So um, yes, I'm the author of many books. Weirdly, most of my books deal with portals in some way, but few deal with portals in as blunt away as obvious away as the shades of magic series it's predicated on an idea I, I wanted to write about multiple worlds of course portals tend to lead between here and there but instead of writing about four distinct spaces four different worlds connected by a door i essentially designed the same world dressed four ways i designed four worlds on the same bones the idea being what if each world had a different reaction to the existence of magic. So we have our world, Grey London, which essentially has forgotten magic. It's a mundane place. You go through one portal uh, if you're lucky enough to have that ability and you're in Red London, 
Red London has this access to magic and abundance of it. It worships, worships it like a god. You go one further, you're in White London. White London has chosen to enslave magic, to bind it to it to the people. You go one further, you hit Black London, which was once the most powerful and essentially consumed itself. So I wanted to look at how I could do, um, that's my spin on portals. But essentially the story follows Kel, who is a magician, a very rare kind of magician with the ability to move between worlds. It is a. It used to be slightly more common. He's what's called an Antari magician. These magicians no longer exist, except for maybe two or three in the entire four worlds. And so he moves between the worlds. He is in Grey London one night when he gets his pocket picked by a street thief named Delilah Bard, who then hitches a ride with him back through the Londons. And so we have a person who has the ability, is very familiar with traveling between worlds, believes himself to be one of the only people alive, and then kind of an upstart shows up, an intruder who has this ability as well. So it's definitely in the portal fantasy canon, but I just also wanted to say that in my contrarian vein of being the person who wants to break down all the boundaries between what is and isn't a portal, one of the main arguments that I make whenever I'm teaching courses is that books are inherently portals. At their most reductive self, every single work of fiction is itself a portal, especially by your definition of compressing time and space, taking us from one space of reality to another. I would argue that every single time a reader picks up a book and opens that book and engages with the story in that book, that is a threshold that they are crossing themselves. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very interesting. And I mean, in, in, back to boring academic world, um, narratology, particularly now is moving towards a model of story worlds, what they call story worlds, which is very much focused. I find that really interesting on reader, the reader's immersive sort of projection of the totality uh, and sort of readily mapping of that world, which I think is a really interesting kind of future area and kind of fits with what, you, what you're saying um, there. I guess um, one question I, I had before I before I go back to the, the board was, um, I mean, authors never like to, you know, people say, oh, but this reminded me of this or this, or, but, but I think with portals, that's okay. I think the portal is also inherently quite intertextual, you know, it's sort of almost part of it. Sure. Um, I mean, for me, reading it, what I really liked about um, the book, the first book, I'm on the second now, um, it reminded, it to me, it was like a mashup of Ursula Le Guin and uh, Diane Wynne-Jones. And I yes. love, those are two of my favorite authors, actually. So uh, am I on the money there or, or, or am I not? I did break into a really big smile when I saw Howl's Moving Castle in the diagram. Yes, exactly, yes. In the, yeah. I mean, the, the door in Howl's Moving Castle, it's a very classic door. Weirdly, I would say that it's a love letter to to Diana Wynne Jones and also to a fair amount of anime, which also deals with portals in a really fun and elegant way and also deals with magic. I would say that the Diana Wynne Jones component is the door and the anime component, kind of full metal alchemist brotherhood component, and the Avatar the Last Airbender component is the magic. And so most novels, especially in the fantasy space, of course we're in conversation with other fantastical things that we adore. But I really hearken towards thresholds and portals that have a bit of the fable, a bit of the folkloric. Yeah. And I think Diana Wynne Jones was one of those rare authors who write expansive mm -hmm. fantasy that mm -hmm. felt like fantasy. And actually, How's Weaving Castle, that 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 um, very early text is exactly like that. I was thinking, oh my God, maybe she'd read it. I mean, she was pretty knowledgeable, Diana Wynne Jones. So maybe she'd read <laughs> George and she nicked it from him, I don't know, because it's very similar to how. Def I definitely, definitely. The doorway with multiple yeah. doorways on it is a, is a very classic image. I would, I mean, as is gates, uh, thresholds of any kind, really. I mean, mostly door shaped ones. I think we tend to, whereas like fi science fiction favors the whole, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like fantasy yeah. favors the yeah. door. Yeah. But I think it's the bargain. Because I think in fantasy, everything has a cost. And I think there's something about the choice, like the whole, the science fiction portal, if you will, is open by default. It's like an open thing that you have to pass through. But the door in fantasy is by nature closed. And you are making the choice as the hero, as the protagonist to put your hand on that threshold and turn it, not being able to see what's on the other side and pass through. 
I think the door is also man-made. I was thinking about that. You have man-made and natural. And is the door, yeah. again, it's that tension between feeling in control of the portal. You feel more in control of the portal if it's a door. Well, than... it's man-made in some cases, right? In others, the question is, it's what made? I mean, like sometimes a door seems to be grown out of nature itself. Sometimes the door mm -hmm. seems, I mean, it's the cave. It's the, it's the thing that has no origin or that has a mysterious origin or in some fantasy and fairy tales, the thing which seems to grow up overnight, the thing which was not part of the house, the, you know, the, it's the addition, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the misplaced element. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to hog you, so I'm going to <laughs> pick out a few things. So Kent by is uh, is also like me, kind of looking at your origins. Did you look at the video game name Portal, released in 2007? I guess either of you, this could be for any of you, how portals are used as a video game puzzle mechanic. And if this fits into the wall archetype or if interactive portals, yeah, a port, so the yes. game is a portal called Portal. Does it transcend the 18 archetypes? I mean, this is uh, that is, uh, well, it's brilliant. I think we were, we put portal, um, the portals in portal <laughs> as uh, the chalk portals, right? We were no, it's, it's, or, it's an uh, energy frame. Sorry. And yeah, which is different uh, than chalk because <laughs> chalk, you might draw it, whereas an energy yeah. frame is this usually ring-like thing um, that you go through. And there is so many like that also in, in sci-fi. Uh, but yeah, that is so fascinating in, in terms of design and uh, that game was so important in terms of uh, showing the possibilities uh, that portals could bring. And I think Kent was also asking about uh, the portals in VR chat and the depth that they have in terms of well, credentials and so on, all the things that you are asked when you as you are crossing that portal in virtual reality you, know, you get all these pop-ups and all these things that you need to accept mm. and i think that's really interesting also with regards mm. to the mm. conversation about the door just before that i think also maybe connects to the typology of the door um, in architecture you know where the door was the thing that stopped you from going through but very often it was a container of information about what was behind Know, like mm. the doors to a palace mm. were highly decorated mm. really um true. so we often think about portals and the threshold itself um as uh, something that could contain uh, a certain amount of information about where mm. you are crossing into mm. and probably almost inevitably it's going to be also a space where you will uh, give away a lot of information about yourself <laughs> to be let in maybe hopefully mm. not um uh, but uh, and on that note i wanted to come back to victoria and ask ask yeah. something that maybe sell you also are curious about this when Lara's mentioning give something of yourself I think one of the very okay. very super interesting thing with the portals in your in your in the series is the sacrifice that a magician has to make mm. to give of their blood that would mm. be super interesting for you to speak a little bit about the thinking around that and sort of how it dominates the, the narrative or what it does to the story of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe that like all all magic should have a cost. There's this erroneous idea when you're writing fantasy that like fantasy doesn't have rules and science fiction does. But the rules in fantasy are, of course, there. They're embedded in the architecture of the world itself. They're embedded in the design of the world. And so when I'm designing worlds, I'm bringing it back to as intuitive a place as possible. And for that, I rely on nature. And there's always like, there are certain rules in nature in terms of give and take potential and kinetic. Um, and, you know, obviously bodily sacrifice is a really archetypal idea. It's not uncommon, but it's very specific to this kind of magician in the book, because in the book, there are multiple kinds of magic. There's elemental magic, which is, you know, earth, air, wind, fire, there are earth, you know, earth, water, wind, fire, and there's spells, which is essentially man-made complex magic. And then there's Antari magic, and Antari magic is in the middle, and they're the only magicians who use blood, and it comes of themselves, and it's seen as kind of the elegant intersection of the element and the spell. But yes, in order for Kel to draw a door, arguably there are no doors. Kel is the yeah. door himself. He is essentially yeah, 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 yeah. constructing a door around himself mm. using blood. And so he always has to give something of himself. Um, as the series goes on, it costs more, cost changes, cost is not a static thing. The farther we go, the more tired our legs get and magic is the same way. But yeah, I, I always work cost into the design of any threshold. Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah, the sacrifice. So I'm just going to pick up on um, David's question here. 
that kind of connects to that a bit. And he says, uh, well, there's two questions. Is the rise in portals and literature driven by the rise of science and decrease in belief in the spirit world? And it looks to me from what you said, the rise in portals and literature may be a reaction to the decline in mass belief. Why do you think people want these physical parallel spaces? Why do people want portals? <laughs> I mean, that the spiritual thing is interesting because see, I always think about C.S. Lewis and obviously C.S. Lewis is a very famous convert, Christian convert. And in, in his you know, very powerful writings on conversion, actually, he says, knock, you know, knock and the door will be opened. And that's what it's like. It's so simple. It's so basic, you know, and that's what's the kind of power of that. So with him and obviously in Narnia, you know, you think all of the, port the portals do always have this kind of that, that again, that's that chosen thing. They have a kind of spirituality. Well, obviously, they're taking you, you know, to a, a better place in a way. They they have a spiritual dimension. They require um, faith. I mean, like literally faith, every yeah. portal is yeah. a leap of faith unto yeah. itself, especially yeah. coming back to the opacity of them. In science fiction, it's the frontier. It's the yeah. people who go through portals don't know if they're going to be safe on the other end, but they have to yeah. have a belief in their quest in fantasy. It, the very act of moving through a portal is an act of faith. So I yeah. think that it's, I would say like, I disassociate faith from religion, you know, religion yeah. institution and spirituality being a, a personal relationship to whatever your higher power is. But I absolutely think that you either have faith in yourself and your ability to survive this thing, or you have faith in the systems that you have put in place that have made the door or mm. made the threshold. Mm. And I guess actually, I mean, that this sort of comes back to your question, you you earlier saying, why does it emerge at a certain time? Um, I mean, I think, you know, Christianity is just another form of a kind of platonic version where there's this world and there are other worlds, you know, it's just a spirit, it's a spiritual version of that, isn't it? So in a way, like a parallel, parallel universe theory must emerge, it must emerge, it must emerge sometime around 1950s, maybe according to you. Uh, I bet scientifically, but in a way that's just a kind of an alternative version of like a platonic, you know, there, there is another world other than our own. Well, this is where I just become dangerously like I just want to like have you know, lunch with Lauren Frederick and then just wear away at the edges of their boundaries because I'm like everything's a everything's a portal like everything's a threshold like it just becomes it becomes mm. a, a murky gray area as you start to, you know, think about a threshold as the difference between here and there. And an, yeah. all, all that is required is that there is a slightly different version of reality than here, mm. then a lot of things become threshold adjacent. No, no you're right. That's really Absolutely. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're drawing near the end um but we can we can overrun a bit if we want to so if the guys have a look through the question see if there's anything that you're that you feel like you really really should answer i think um um jay mitchell says how did the vr project come to be at the so museum i think we should answer maybe answer that question give us a bit of uh context for the project how did it come about i mean it's a great it's obviously a great match but how did it how did it mm. come about? yeah we, we we have um this sort of fifth solo exhibition that often explores ideas of virtual space or virtual experience, spatial experiences that are being mediated in one way or another. And we have produced VR films before. And this Omniseum approach, that's, I think, because of, of this, um, this history we have with this sort of work that we've been doing, doing so far. And in spending a lot of time at this Omniseum and with a two-year very happily delay of the exhibition opening, we had extra time and realized that the study that we have wanted to do for a long time now is the time, and they, there's no better place than the Soul Museum. Um, and uh, it's very much a, a film; it's just experienced in a VR headset. And for us, it's a very unique way of actually embedding someone, especially in this case, into a portal-like experience, which is what mm -hmm. it's sort of like to step into media when you're wearing a headset like this. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit of a, a short summary of how how it <laughs> came about. <laughs> Can I, I want to ask a question that kind of combines both Isadora's and Christine's questions on fear about the relationship between portals and mythology, looking at older stories like Hades and the underworld, because I feel like by the definition that you two have created, it has to be instantaneous, it can't be the, there isn't like a limb, can there be a liminal, like I think of a good example would be like the latest season of Umbrella Academy has a liminal space between two alternate hotels. And in order to move from one hotel to the other, you have to go through a short hallway. Does the existence of a liminal space 
negate a portal for you? Does it become something else? No, no, absolutely not. In fact, the liminal dimension is one of the characteristics okay. that we were trying to map. Um, it is interesting. It was Christine that, that was asking, can a journey be a portal? And is mm. yes, perhaps for yourself, no? In that regard, from a design perspective, you would be the only one to be able to tell what was here and what was there. Okay. Right. Whereas if you are as a designer creating a portal for people to use and for uh, the widest uh, possible group of people to be able to identify now I'm here and now I'm on my way and now I reached there, then probably we need to work, which what we thought, I mean, the reason why we were looking at uh, doing this whole study was to understand from a design perspective, what communicates crossing and uh, when is it useful yet to extend that liminal dimension and how much can we expand it for you not to lose track of yeah. the fact that you are not there yet <laughs> you are still you, on the way because you have like the river sticks doesn't work necessarily like it starts to erode the concept of a portal once you have the quest once you have the journey that's required to go from here to there then you would argue that each step becomes important and so you can't collapse it down, right? But it's, you start wondering how long can I stretch the liminal yeah. space that takes me from here to there? Yeah, and, and I really think maybe like, from, I mean, that would, yeah. it'd be interesting, Victoria, to hear what you think, but I, at some point it is a journey where your body and mind is actually traveling through time and space the way we understand things the way they normally happen. And if you just twist it a tiny bit, technically, then it's, I guess it's a portal. If you think about light speed in star wars or something you know sometimes yeah. they're sitting there uh, playing chess or whatever for a long time while they're in the in, or mm -hmm. alice when she falls down the rabbit hole she or... has time to do lots of things yeah, in the yeah, rabbit yeah. Holes, right? yeah so that's like, true no i i agree I, I think of the difference between looking at howl's moving castle for instance the difference between seven league boots which help you travel vast distances but it's still a physical transportation method versus the door which allows you an instant shortcut mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So what do you think, Victoria? Oh, I think I, I think it's a different I think you end up having to create a different category because I think that um, unless you have I mean, there are certain mythological retellings that have kind of a straight drop into the underworld. But if you're dealing with any kind of journey between here and there, I think that the in between becomes just as important. And I think it doesn't become a portal anymore. I think it becomes um, a mode of transportation. I think that the portal has to be the mode of transportation. The mm. bit, yeah, yeah, right. And then this the psychogeographic aspect of it also that like if the in between, if the portal becomes a place, you know, yeah. then we get into a that's in the, his dark materials. Yeah. It's a whole city, the in-between space, the way mm. people spend a lot of time even. Yeah. Yeah, but also part of the part of the thing of the portal is that that contrast between the here and the there. Uh -huh. So the the longer the the narrative between the less that that contrast being diminished by what's coming between so then you're kind of losing that part you know the immediacy of the, the contrast of the portal I suppose in a sense um just a quick practical question here for from Matthew Hills are there any plans for a publication based on the exhibition and the VR films it would be very useful to be able to reference space populist research yes that's yes. the that's Somebody the ambition <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's the the ambition, and and yeah. uh, it it will will get there. It, it will take a while. We're we're next step is we're going to have a little lecture performance about this work, and uh, eventually, hopefully, there will be either a book or at least an online archive that can everyone can use. Okay, so watch this space, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. There is an epic last question that I think one can oh, finish with. Uh, <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> that is, okay. Uh, with so many things acting as thresholds or being threshold adjacent, could we think of time and our lives as a big one-way <laughs> portal? <laughs> 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 that can imagine it, just uh, finish <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, let's say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isn't there some description that I can't remember now of the bird, you know, your life is just the bird flying through the building and one side goes in one side comes out the other that's it <laughs> um Brilliant. yeah yeah i, I mean I, I i think what's interesting about threshold is whether you choose to cross it or not to me that's almost the most interesting thing you know if I, if, it, if a portal opened up right here in my room would i actually go through it i would <laughs> in a heartbeat <laughs> you're much younger than me though <laughs> but also by your definition then life is not a portal 
because you don't choose to enter it. Yeah. You and you like that's your starting place. Like life is your default. It's your it's your foundation. You have to choose a departure from it in order to enter port. By that argument, not to be very morbid, that death is the portal. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, of course, that's the platonic again. That's our portal. We don't know where we're going. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I think what what scares me, I, I find the portals quite scary. So as a kid, I mean, uh, you know, I I was force fed Enid Blyton, and um, I don't know if any of you read the Faraway Tree. Did anyone read the Folk of the Faraway Tree? In the Folk of the Faraway Tree, there's a tree where all kinds of exciting lands appear at top. But if you don't get out of that land in time and climb down, it moves on, and you're stuck in this world and you can't get back. And as a, as like a six year old, I was like, oh my god, I hate the faraway tree. It's like this horrible, freaky place. So, and the same in Magician's Nephew. There's all these pools, and they don't they get out and they don't mark the pool that they came out of. And they're like, <gasps> it was the, it is this one. If we haven't marked the pool, we can't get back. So for me, that's the thing. I think if I can if I can go through and I can get back, okay, mm. maybe I'll give it a go. But it's that that is a mass. I find that a kind of primal fear of going through and then they're being like well and not not knowing not being able to get back oh my god no yeah and orientation or being able to find your breadcrumbs right yeah yeah you can see that that. yeah the the different ways in which people feel comfortable using the internet not those who keep all the tabs open so that they can yes yes, it's kind of an impossible task and those that just go forward (laughs) (laughs) I, i don't know which one uh it, it, it's whatever it's just <laughs> it's, it's interesting to see these different ways of dealing with the mm. uh, kind of the importance of backtracking or mm. saving things or knowing how to go back where you came from as opposed to just like forward exploration mm. which is yeah. and i was just curious uh, i know we were running over but this is this everything is so fascinating I wanted to ask victoria having now like quite a lot of books uh that you've written that include portals or in one way or another kind of deal with this and obviously i'm sure you have <clears throat> many in your mind to to come or or a sort of thinking about how you will continue to use this idea of portals of worlds sort of your thoughts may not obviously revealing what you're working on but just your general thoughts about sort of the future of your work or the future of portal storytelling or I mean, I see it everywhere. I want to just maybe use that question to pivot to answer uh, something that you spoke about earlier, which is kind of the answer to the question about the Westernization and really looking through like a white Western lens. Part of that is just from the business of storytelling, which is that for so many years, um, both publishing and Hollywood, which tends to dictate the majority of media, has preferred and given preferential treatment to like straight white male stories and those journeys. And so it creates a disproportionate quantity of a very specific kind of narrative. I do think we're entering a time where we're finally getting some cross pollination, where we're finally seeing those stories that have always existed, but have not been given the same amount of space in media and in coverage. And so I'm really excited as a reader to get to read stories that involve portals from a very different philosophical bent, from a very different geographic and and identity bent. Um, As far as my own, like it's in every single book. I would argue that a a kind of portal, a kind of threshold is in play because I'm interested in that kind of magic. I grew up looking for doors in the world. I grew up looking for keyholes in the walls and patterns on wallpaper. And so I'm I'm writing what I wanted to read, which is just constantly looking for more. Well, I think that's a really, really good positive uh, point to end. An end that is a new beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, let's just, I'm just going to conclude by first um, clap I'm going to clap you and everyone uh, the questions at home can clap as well thank you very much to you to all three of you for for, for your excellent comments and uh, things eh? and I'm also going to clap the questioners because you did great guys you know so many questions thank you really really good questions Fantastic. Wish we could have answered them all thank you so much we tried we did try quite hard <laughs> Um, and thank you obviously to the Soma Museum for kind of hosting us virtually hosting us um, and as as I said at the beginning if you're in London or near London or visiting London, honestly, you will, it is a unique experience that you'll never forget. Both the museum itself and Space Popular. Okay, and uh, on that note, we're gonna end. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and Sally and Victoria. And it's and such a pleasure to, to have this conversation with you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you all.